I invite Mr. Shiraman Prakash. Mr. Shiraman Prakash is pursuing a PhD in theoretical physics at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, focusing on string theory. He has a bachelor's degree in physics from John Hopkins University, where he received Provost Awards for undergraduate research, a master's degree in physics from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, where he received awards for best academic performance and best project work. He is a regular visitor to the Dialbag Educational Institute, where he occasionally gives many lecture courses on various topics related to string theory. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Okay, so ultimately this meeting is okay about the sometimes profound applications of quantum mechanics to computer science, nanotechnology, and perhaps most intriguingly, biology. But okay, quantum field theory is the basic language used by physicists to describe nature, and, and string theory is, is a leading candidate for a globally consistent unified quantum theory. So it might be useful to just to begin the, the conference with, with a brief qualitative overview of research in this area. And the talk won't be technical. The only goal is, is just really to gain a qualitative appreciation for the richness of quantum mechanics. And okay, to avoid, okay, so the only real talk is simply a qualitative introduction to quantum field theory, strings, and duality. Here we have quantum field theory, which has two limiting cases. One is classical field theory, which is classical electromagnetism, and one is quantum mechanics of particles. This has a further limit, which is classical mechanics. And quantum field theory in okay, does not describe general relativity. It, it only describes other forces as well. So at one level, quantum field theory can be thought of as a theory that just describes quantum particles with ill-defined trajectories continually popping in and out of space. Okay, at, at a practical level, quantum field theory provides a, a set of rules for drawing these diagrams, associating numbers with them, squaring those numbers and adding them up and then interpreting them physically. So he, here we have, we have a so such, such diagrams can be thought of as calculational tools, or they can be thought of as, as heuristically representing the, the probability that a particle might be traveling suddenly emit a photon, which would be absorbed by another particle, and then move along its way. And, and to calculate physical quant observable quantities, you, you have to sum over all such diagrams one can draw. So forces in, in quantum field theory are mediated by quantum particles, which were represented by the green lines in, in the previous diagrams. So for example, the, the force of electromagnetism is mediated by a single particle, the photon. However, to describe other forces, we have to use a natural generalization of electrodynamics called Yang-Mills theory. In Yang-Mills theory, the central idea is to replace the single photon of electrodynamics by several gauge bosons. And these gauge bosons es essentially correspond to entries of an n by n So at the level of equations, in Maxwell's equations, describe an electric and magnetic field, which in turn can be described by a vector potential. And the vector potential takes on values which are real numbers. But to describe other forces, we have to generalize the vector potential 
to be, say, her mission makers here and by any mission makers. And unlike photons, non-really engaged bosons directly interact with each other and hence describe effectively nonlinear vortices. And this nonlinearity is due to the fact that when you multiply two matrices together, the order matters. So all, all forces that, that quantum field theory can describe are described by Yang matrices. So, so the electroweak interactions are described by Yang Lewis theories where the gauge bosons form either two cross two matrix or one cross one matrix. And a one cross one matrix is a special case which also sort of reduces the electromagnetism. Quantum chromodynamics, the gauge bosons form a three cross three matrix and attempts to unify these forces in, into grand unified, grand unified theories are essentially at a quality level, they, they're, they're attempts to, to describe these forces as arising from a single yang Lewis theory of say five cross five matrices. The dynamics of yang Lewis theories is much more quantum complicated than quantum electromagnetism. This is sort of obvious physically because atomic physics is easy to, is relatively easy to study since you can solve for the spectrum of hydrogen atom, et cetera, and have, have a good qualitative picture <coughs> of other atoms. But, okay, nuclear physics is very mysterious. Okay, and, and okay, ultimately the, the fundamental force for, for nuclear physics is is a Yang Lu theory, but going from Yang Lu to nuclear physics is, is, is very difficult. Okay, and in electrodynamics, you know, if you just have two electrons at rest, they, they interact via a Coulomb force, and it's it's easy to describe that. In Yang Lu's theory, the particles charged under the Yang Lu's force, which are, are quarks. Okay, we 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 know experimentally they interact. They are confined and they interact through a force that increases linearly with, I mean, through a, through a force such that the potential energy increases linearly with the separation, but we can't even derive that analytically from, from, from the theory itself. <coughs> Dynamics of the angular theories is much more complicated than quantum electromagnetism, and if we could have a better picture of Yang Lu's theories, which allowed us to better understand the dynamics that would represent major progress in theoretical physics. Even toy model Yang Lu's theories, not not necessarily the one the ones used to describe fundamental to actual observed physical forces. However, there is a limit in which Yang Lu's theories might simplify, you might be able to say something about the angular series, and that's a large n limit. So although going from numbers to matrices made the theory much more complicated, if we just make the matrices really big, so n cross n matrices where n is very large, then actually we accept, expect a new simplifying limit. And qualitatively, the reason for this is just the law of large numbers, you expect quantum fluctuations to be suppressed by some power of n when n is large. So if, if, if you do this, work out the large n expansion carefully, you do in, indeed find uh, a simplification which, which is easy to describe graphically. And, and I, I'll just do that for you now. So, okay. okay, in general, to calculate any quantum, you have to just draw a bunch of Feynman diagrams and associate numbers with them. And you can draw a variety of different types of Feynman diagrams. So, so consider the first Feynman diagram, which, which just represents a photon turning into a quark and quark pair, and along the way they 
change who you are and then turn back to who you were before. So this, this diagram can be drawn on a plane without any of the lines intersecting with one another. However, if we consider this next diagram, which also represents a very similar physical process, but, but the quark emits the gluon and this which is absorbed after the other quark emits the gluon, we find that we can't draw this diagram on a plane without some line intersecting. However, you can draw it on a, on a, on a surface which has a handle coming out of it, like, like this surface. So, so this, this Feynman diagram is actually technically known as a Feynman diagram of a higher degree, in the sense that you can draw it without any self-intersection if you had a piece of paper that had a handle sticking out of it, as this one here. And again, in this diagram, you need actually two handles to draw it without any intersection. So, and so in general, you can ask, okay, given a Feynman diagram, what what is the minimum genus of a surface of, of a piece of paper on which I can draw it without intersection? So what's the minimum number of handles I can put on the paper so that I can draw this Feynman diagram without having any, any unnecessary interactions? I mean, of course, these are physical, but interactions which, which where there's uh, intersections where there's no interaction. And that's a well-defined topological quality for any, for any diagram. So it turns out that in the large end limit, only diagrams which can be drawn on a plane are possible. Diagrams which, which are drawn on a plane with a handle are suppressed by a factor of one over n squared. And diagrams which have two handles, which can be drawn on surfaces with two handles are suppressed by order one over n to the fourth and so, so on and so forth. So you can rewrite basically the sum of Feynman diagrams as a sum over surfaces of increasing genus when organized in a one over n respect. So, so in this sense, we, we can, by if, if, we, if we draw all the possible diagrams on, on this, planar diagram here, we would get, that looks sort of like we're summing over all possible triangulations of this plane, which in turn looks like you're just summing over all possible surfaces which don't have any handles. Then here, for the one over n squared correction, you, you want to sum over all possible surfaces which topologically have one handle, so all possible triangulations, and so on and so forth. So the lesson, or this is the statement of this slide is simply that you can reorganize this sum of Feynman diagrams as in a way where it looks like a sum over surfaces of increasing genus if you organize the sum in, as a power series in one over n squared. So, so the question is how, how do we interpret a sum over surfaces as opposed to sum over, over linear graphs drawn with lines intersecting that plane? And, and the answer is, is, of course, string theory. And it comes because a particle trajectory in one is a one-dimensional world line in space-time, whereas a string trajectory is a two-dimensional surface in space-time, as, as seen in Hu's figure. So the ana analogy of Feynman diagram where here you have a particle coming in, it's changing another particle coming out. Looks like a surface in space time where you have some strings coming in, intersecting and coming out. And okay, more complicated Feynman diagrams would be surfaces with holes in them. This is just a surface with a hole, not a handle, but you can imagine a surface with a handle and, and, and expanding the sum over, over strings over World series so is, is a sum over surfaces of with more and more handles, and that's that's how we would describe an interacting theory of quantum space. So, if you carefully study the interacting theory of quantum strings described in this way, 
you find that that you may find things which were initially unexpected. Okay, interactions which define in this way must include gravity. That's not a choice. Secondly, the strings must live in 10 dimensional space time just, just by virtue of having a consistent sum or a theory consistent with the entirety and, and all the quantities of, of quantum mechanics. Okay, you also need, need a, a symmetry which is called super symmetry that relates to Orlando specifically on, but I, I'll just, we won't mention that because that's completely technical, but I'll skip that. So, so a sum over surfaces, which is what string theory is, 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 is a quantum theory of gravity in 10 dimensions. Okay, and that's of course interesting because we didn't have the quantum gravity, theory of gravity earlier, and even though it's 10 dimensions, you can imagine compactifying those extra dimensions and getting a quantum theory of gravity in, in four dimensions. But, but, and it's interesting for, for various re reasons like that, but it's, it's puzzling because earlier on we started with a four dimensional quantum theory without gravity called the Yang-Mills theory and we re rewrote that as a sum over surfaces and that makes it sort of puzzling because because the Yang-Mills theory is a quantum theory which cannot include gravity and lives in four space-time dimensions. Again, that looks like a sum over surfaces, but string theory is a theory that must include gravity and it lives in 10 dimensions, 10 space-time dimensions. So, so how can these two <coughs> pictures be consistent? And okay, okay, the answer comes from a, a slightly more careful study of the quantum mechanics of strings, as well as the classical 10, di the 10 dimensional theories of gravity, string theory described in the cla classical limit. And basically, okay, string theory includes, also includes, it turns out that it also includes other objects called D brains, pictured here, and D brains are extended objects for hyperspace planes in space-time on which strings can begin and end. So various types of brains exist, but the particularly important variety are D3 brains, so brains which are extended in three spatial directions. And they also, of course, have a fourth ti time, time direction to a world volume. So if, if you study the quantum mechanics of strings ending on D brains, you would you will see that the low energy dynamics of a stack of n coincident D3 brains is described by a maximally supersymmetric version of the Yang Mills theory based on n, n cross n matrices. And it's sort of easy to, to picture the different types of of force carrying particles in the theory as, as <coughs> strings starting on one brain and ending on another brain correspond to a, a particular entry in the, in the matrix describing the force field. So A11 could, is this string, A12 is, is this string, A21 is, is this string, A and so on and so forth. So there's nine different types of strings that can pop in and out of existence when you're describing inter a stack of D brains and those correspond to the nine entries or nine types of, of gauge bosons in a, in a theory of Yang-Mills based on D, D cross D brains. But okay, D brains also exert a gravitational field and, and for large n can be described as solutions of a, of a classical 10 dimensional supergravity theory, look, which, which solutions which really look like a black hole with a black hole with, which is not a hole but a plane in space time. So there, there are two, two different pictures of D brains which, ha which one has. One is quantum objects with strings begin and end, and another is just sources of, of gravity. 
But if, 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 you, if you stare at this picture long enough, you might pause, you might pause and make the following guess. That, that the two, two, there are two equivalent ways of describing low energy dynamics of two brains. Okay, one is as a quantum field theory describing, as, as Yang Mills theory would describe in this picture. The second way as a, is as a quantum theory of gravity living in the region of space time near the two free brains. If you adjust the parameters on both sides Correct, correctly, they should be, in fact, describing the same physical phenomena, albeit in two very different <coughs> languages. So, so near, near the stack of D3 brains, the space time has a curved geometry, which is called ADS5 plus S5. And, and the important point is ADS5 is a five dimensional space time of constant negative curvature as shown here. Okay, it, it, it so the, uh, and okay, in, 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 in general relativity, this gravity is described as a curvature of space time. So, 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 so the region near the, of space time near the gravitational field of D3 brains is a curved geometry, and that geometry is called anti visitor space. Two dimensional anti visitor space is pictured here, where each of these circles is the same size, but okay, this because it's distorted, they look like they're getting smaller and smaller. So it's an infinite space, but it has a boundary. And okay, this is just, and it's a, con and it has constant negative curvature. So this is picture of anti visitor space. So what, what is the, the claim? So, so when two apparently different theories secretly describe equivalent physics, they're said to be dual. <coughs> so to be dual, and the conjecture is that maximally supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory in three plus one dimensions is in, in fact equivalent to a particular n-dimensional quantum theory of gravity that arises as a limit of string theory. And when n is large, this, this, this equivalence is, is manageable because classical gravity under additional circumstances may be a good approximation to the quantum field. So again, so this is a slightly bizarre conclusion. We initially were describing forces which did not include gravity in three plus one dimensions. Yet, by considering the existence of three brains and, or rewriting the Feynman diagrams in a different way, etc., we, we we come to the conclusion that it should be possible, at least in a certain limit, to rewrite these the, this theory as a quantum theory of gravity in a higher dimensional space time. This was this was a bizarre conclusion to duality con to conjecture, but if people have since then tested the duality very carefully by calculating non-trivial quantities on both sides and finding that they agree. So, so in the past five or 10 years or so, people have, have, have now actually accepted this duality as a fact that maximum, that, that, that quantum field theories without gravity can be rewritten in such a way that they look like quantum theories of gravity in higher dimensional space times. And, and, and what's interesting about this is that the dynamical properties of the quantum field theory translate into geometric properties of the higher dimensional space time. So, so super yang mills theory has the property that it's a conformal theory, that it's scale invariant. So as you change the energy scale with which you study the theory, the dynamic remains unaffected. This this translates into a into a symmetry of of anti visitor space producing sort of picture that all these circles are equivalent to each other. <coughs> and you can say that in more to the scale of mathematical dimensions. But the point is 
for getting dynamical information and okay, the energy scale at which you probe the theory, via this duality gets translated into a into a geometric into the geometric properties of the of the particular classical background of the quantum theory of gravity that this dual thing, which which is what this is interested in. Okay, so what, what, why do you care about such a duality? So, so, so this gives you a new picture for, for studying quantum gravity and in particular, I mean, addressing conceptual problems in quantum gravity, even though this is, and, and, in, and use it, using this picture, Mal Sen in 2001 gave, gave an argument about the black hole information loss paradox that that satisfied Stephen Hawking and, and made him concede his bet with with, a, with John Pascal about, about whether or not you could have even a quantum theory that describes black holes. You could also go the other way around. You could try to now use classical gravity calculations to model the behavior of strongly attracting quantum fields at finite temperature. And people have done this and often claim that at least the, these such calculations have been qualitatively relevant for experiments at relative disc at the RHIC collider in Brookhaven, which where you collide two gold nuclei together, and it forms a quark muon plasma. And, and of course, that quark muon plasma isn't described by supersymmetric Yang mills, but qualitatively, its behavior is similar to supersymmetric Yang mills, and hence is qualitatively described by a black hole. So, so people claim such a duality has been relevant to the data analysis of those experiments. So that's, that's, that's all I have to say. So in, in this talk, we argued that the quantum field theory is used to describe fundamental non-gravitational forces, yang mills theories, look like string theories or quantum theories of gravity in the large end limit. Via D-brains, one can make the precise conjecture that maximally supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory actually is a quantum theory of gravity in higher dimensional negatively curved space time, if, if you look at it in the space. And, okay, this discovery, although not immediately applicable to real world theories, represents important progress in addressing two of the major unsolved problems in theoretical physics, understanding quantum gravity and understanding the dynamics of quantum fields. So thank you very much.